as part of Big Think Mentor, which is um, Big Think's lifelong learning channel on YouTube. I'm Jason Gotts, and we're very, very happy today to be joined by Maria Konnikova, author of Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. In her workshop on Big Think Mentor, she teaches thinking skills from the master sleuth, including observation, deduction, and imaginative problem solving, among others. And we're here as a follow-up to that workshop uh, with Sid Burgess, who's a member of Big Think Mentor's learning community. Uh, welcome, Maria. We're delighted that you're here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for this. I've never done a Google Plus Hangout before. So, um, and this is our first ever, so bear with us if there's background noise or any other technical interruptions or, you know, suddenly the Google Plus animation of a mustache or something <laughs> should appear on one of us. Um, so I think what we'll do, we'll start with, you know, essentially this is a follow-on to Maria's workshop on Mentor, which is called How to Think Like uh, Sherlock Holmes. You can get there by going to youtube.com slash user slash Big Think Mentor. And we're asking follow-up questions. Um, I have some questions. We've got other questions from members of Mentor's community. And we'll start with um, Sid. Uh, and Sid, if you'd like to introduce yourself, you know, say a couple of words um, about what brought you to Mentor or what, you know, what, what, you're, what you're up to, um, and, then, uh, and then go ahead and ask Maria your questions. Yeah, so I just, I think, uh, Sid Burgess, I think I'm just kind of addicted uh, to uh, the notion of trying to um, hone uh, personal skills to try to, you know, improve your life from day to day. Uh, just I enjoy the topic in general, so I've been a big fan of uh, of the channel, and even before you guys uh, uh, went to Big Think Mentor, so I'm really kind of excited to be a part of this. Um, yeah, I had a question uh, just to kind of kick things off. I really was curious uh, what uh, some of the mentors was wanting to get out of this whole experience themselves. Um, we we sort of are used to kind of receiving this uh, feedback or receiving this these uh, good ideas, but part of uh, part of the uh, part of the brilliance of this whole kind of community is is that everybody's kind of is getting something out of it too as well. So I was just kind of curious, Mary, what what are you looking to get out of uh, Big Think Mentor? Well, I'm looking to get out of it. That's a, a wonderful question. Questions just like the one that you asked. So when you really have um, people who interact with you and who ask new questions, you look at things in a different way, and it makes you think about topics that you wouldn't think about otherwise, which I think is really important. So when I, whenever I answer questions from readers, whenever I give talks and answer questions from the audience, there's, you know, there are always questions that repeat, but there's always something new. And I say, huh, that's really interesting. And then I start thinking about it, and it lets me develop my ideas. It's kind of like the Holmes-Watson relationship, actually, mm -hmm. to uh, kind of bring it back to that. I think that Watson really improves Holmes's thinking, and Holmes becomes much better throughout the stories the more he interacts with Watson, because Watson asks provocative questions. He always forces Holmes to stop and think why he's doing what he's doing. And that kind of back and forth is incredibly important um, to keep your thinking sharp, to keep yourself stimulated. I don't think that anyone should ever really work in a vacuum, even though writing is often a very um, solitary profession, but that interaction, I think, is incredibly important. Great. Jason, you want me to ask my second question? Absolutely. Go, go right ahead. <laughs> All right. So the second one uh, is, uh, it's one that I've actually had uh, kind of mulling around in my mind for a while is this notion of, of being too distracted and multitasking. And you mm -hmm. brought it up in one of your videos, so I really wanted to ask you this specifically. I enjoy going, uh, my favorite place in the world, and it really doesn't matter which one it is, is the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. I just enjoy sitting in the coffee shop and just kind of watching the world go by and, and people watching, as we like to say. But almost more than that, too, I just enjoy kind of just uh, almost in a sense of uh, meditation, just taking in all the sights and sounds of whatever city that I'm in and trying to process them almost simultaneously. So I wanted to just ask you, how, how, would, you exp how would you describe maybe in a way that would help, help improve that, uh, that mental uh, exercise in the way that differentiates that from kind of the multitasking or the endorphin driven kind of electronic uh, distraction uh, uh, that we hear a lot about. Can you kind of, can you maybe differentiate the two a little bit and maybe how we can focus in on, on the better one? Sure. So what you like to do is definitely not multitasking. Um, that's 
kind of unitasking at its best because you're doing something very specific. You're kind of watching, you're letting your senses take everything in. So I think the the myth about multitasking is that you you can't be looking at multiple things at once and have that not be multitasking. You can't be doing multiple activities at once. So your brain can't be thinking, okay, I want to do this, but also I want to do this. Oh, I'm watching these people, but also I'm focused on what I'm going to order at the coffee shop, what I'm going to have for lunch, um, what I'm going to do after I leave the coffee shop, what else I have planned for the city. If you were thinking all of these things at the same time, then you'd be multitasking. But if you're kind of in the moment and just soaking everything in, using all of your senses, that's really sensory, kind of taking in the moment in a very mindful fashion, um, which is I think, the purpose of, uh, of mindfulness. So I think those are two very, very different experiences. And in order to really, I think, do, get a lot of out of what you do and get more out of that type of people watching, which, by the way, I think is really interesting and fascinating and helps you just develop as a, as a person and develop your thinking um, and develop your powers of observation, is really realize that that's exactly what you're doing and do your best to avoid distracting thoughts. So if you see someone and that you know puts your mind along the lines of, oh, hey, that person reminds me of my friend X, and suddenly you're thinking about friend X and your mind is going on a tangent, realize that that's happening, stop yourself and come back to just observing and taking everything in. I think that's how you can make the most out of that experience. Okay, great. Um, I have other questions from other mentor members who would have liked to have been with us today, mm -hmm. but could not for technical reasons. So um, we've got Matthew J. Clark is asking, what are the current theories about why task switching causes fatigue? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how he worded the question. And unfortunately, folks aren't here to do follow up. But. Of course. So we know that attention is an incredibly finite resource. So there's really only so much of it to go around. And we can train our attention so that we become better, but we'll never be able to make it infinite. And so one of the things that task switching does is use up mental energy. So you need resources to switch your focus from one thing to another. And the theory is actually is very simple. The more your mind is doing, the more resources it needs. And so every time you switch your attention, you're actually switching circuits. You're switching your focus. You're switching kind of the neural mechanisms behind it, and that expends energy. Literally, you can replenish it by having glucose or other um, other things that actually boost your energy levels. So it's a very, very literal thing that happens. Your brain is actually getting tired. You're actually using resources, um, and you're actually becoming less able to do other things because you use those resources for the task switching, now you no longer have them to pay attention to the tasks that you're doing. There's a lot of really interesting work that um, shows that people who multitask frequently are less efficient at task switching because they're always, they, they don't know how to take those resources and really use them to their full um, potential, which I think is really fascinating because it ends up that heavy multitaskers become worse at the very thing that they should be very good at. Right, right. I've I've read some of that research, and yeah, it's fascinating because you know the the sort of plugged in millennial folks who you would think would be the best at at this actually the more they multitask, it seems the worse they get. Mm -hmm. Yep, they become a worse at being able to filter out distractions, um, and that's a good thing if you want to make sure that you're paying attention to everything. But you also get off task very very. Um, frequently and very easily, which is not a good thing. So not being able to uh, filter out distractions can make you worse at task switching to the tasks you actually want to be switching to, if that makes sense. Because yeah. you might be like, oh, hey, there was this distraction. Maybe I'll do that instead. So in this regard, do you think that sort of we're all doomed, given the you know te <laughs> technological uh, you know mul the sort of multitasking world that folks are growing up in now, or are there things people can do you know to uh, to, to counteract that? I mean, you know, there's concerns about people being addicted. Sure. No, I don't think we're all doomed at all. Um, I think that technology is wonderful, and that we just need to be aware of how much of a 
toll it exerts on us and how difficult that can be to avoid. So what I would say is we need to learn to train our attention um, because as with anything, attention is like a muscle. It's an analogy that you hear all, over and over in psychology. Self-control, like a muscle. You know, everything basically you can say, hey, it's like a muscle because it's an analogy that works incredibly well. So if you train it, it gets stronger, it gets better, you are able to lift more weights, you can, you have more endurance. Um, and similarly with attention, the more you train yourself to uni task and to only pay attention to one thing at a time, the longer and longer and longer you're able to maintain your focus. So what's happening when people um, say that they can't pay attention is that they haven't trained their attention. They've forgotten what it is to have a single-minded focus. And because they haven't trained it, their attention actually has gotten worse. So I think that people, you know, when they say they can't pay attention, they really can't. It doesn't just happen overnight. Um, and so what we can do is try to um, monitor ourselves and really learn to do one thing at a time. For me, that's um, there's been a lot that I've had to do to actually maximize my own potential. When I was writing Mastermind, um, I realized how internet addicted I was, and I actually needed to install um, Freedom, which is an internet blocking software on my computer, so that I wouldn't go online. And it was really hard for me, but eventually I was able to stay offline for four or five hours at a time. Um, and I turned my phone off because otherwise I'd be too tempted to uh, check my internet on the iPhone because unfortunately Freedom doesn't yet block all of your devices. Um, and now I don't really need it nearly as often because I, I know I do it and I've already trained myself not to. Um, it's still nice once in a while. Um, I think we all need to give ourselves mental breaks and realize that the internet is wonderful, but sometimes it's good to just focus and not let those email notifications, those Twitter notifications, all of those things that can just suck our attention, not, not let them interfere. Gotcha. And speaking of attention, uh, for our viewers, the noise that sounds like the ocean is uh, most likely some, you know, Maria uh, lives in a fairly noisy neighborhood. Nothing we can really do about that. Um, <laughs> so that's what that is. Um, okay, let me continue with people's questions um, because I could, I could do follow-ups here all day. Um, Matthew also asks, how can you habituate an input from one sense so that it does not interfere with the attention you give to another sense? For example, reading body language while having a conversation. Well, I think that there are actually two different issues here. Um, habituation is a very specific term when it comes to psychology, and you don't do it. It just happens. It's something that's incredibly, incredibly natural. So as soon as, it, as there's a stimulus that you're hearing, often you, be, you do become habituated to it. Um, so, for instance, one of my favorite examples comes from my personal experience. Um, my freshman year of college, I had a huge church right outside my windows, and it, the bells would ring, and on weekends the bells would ring, and I was a college freshman, I wanted to sleep. Um, and at first they'd always wake me up, and I got to the point where I didn't even hear them, I didn't realize that the bells were um, were ringing, and it's not that I made a conscious effort to habituate, your brain learns to kind of block out the noises that it hears all the time. And the same can be true of vision. So that's why you often, you know, if you tell, if you ask me, you know, what do I pass on my way to work every day, I might not be able to answer. I may think, oh, I know exactly what I pass, but because I do it every day, I don't pay attention to it because I've become habituated to all of those sites. And I may not, may not even notice that a store has closed or a new store has opened in its stead unless something draws my attention to it um, and I'm out of my habituated um, state. So it just happens and what we can do is actually not habituate ourselves and try to if we don't want to. The active part is not habituation but withstanding habituation if that makes sense. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so one other, a question from another uh, mentor member, uh, Jean-Francois Noel, um, asks, Watson is really helpful to homes. Do you have tools or ideas for, you know, 
solutions to create our own imaginary Watson <laughs> or other ways to get a similar benefit without having a Watson if, if well, we don't have one. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting, and I'd stop short of saying have imaginary people conversations <laughs> in your heads, um, just because that you could take that a little bit too far. But you can learn to kind of argue with yourself, and to always. Um, that's actually how I get a lot of my thinking done. You know, I, I say, okay, this is what I think. Well, well, what's the counter argument to that, or why do I think that way? So force yourself almost to be in a debater mindset always. It doesn't just make you more critical of yourself. It makes you critical of all of the information that you're taking in, of everything that you're reading, of everything that you're watching, of all of the constant news and other inputs that you get every day. If you just don't take it in um, as, kind of, as a given and say, oh, that makes sense, Rather, always play devil's advocate and say, wait, that doesn't make sense, because in a, in, a, in a large way, that's exactly what Watson does. And the other good thing to do is get yourself a Watson, um, in the <laughs> sense of get yourself someone you know, with whom you can discuss things, someone who listens to you. Um, it's really good to talk things through, and I think you often find that um, you see gaps in logic when you say something out loud that before um, you you never really voiced. And so one of the ways you can do that is if you think that you know what you're doing, actually pretend that you need to explain it to someone else and explain it, um, be it out loud or you can even write it out. So writing is a, is a good exercise um, through which you can say, hey, did I really understand this? Because writing shows gaps in logic very, very strongly. So if I write something and I'm like, wait, that makes total sense in my head, but on the page it suddenly doesn't make sense, I have to try to figure out why that's the case. And anyone can do that. Um, you don't need anyone else. You don't need to talk to yourself. You don't need to imagine conversations. All you have to do is write out your argument as if you were explaining it to someone else or write out your thinking as if you were explaining it to someone else. That's interesting. Yeah, that's why it can be helpful to keep a, a journal. I know mm -hmm. that I've experienced that in writing a journal, that you, you start writing you know, your thoughts about things and you're surprised to, like, uh, your perspective on them is completely different from what you might have thought it was right. in your head. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I have a couple of questions of, of my own, um, and maybe in the interest of time I'll ask just one of them, and then see if Sid has a follow-up, um, and, uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll close out. I'm looking over here at another computer. That's why I'm not looking at everyone. Um, <laughs> many of the points you make in the workshop. Yes, I'm, I'm multimedia multitasking um, very well. Um, many of the points you make in the workshop add up to the fact that we can't trust our own common sense. That, and, and in your book, of course, Mastermind. Um, our minds make up stories. They're biased to pay attention to some things and ignore others. Uh, and in order to solve problems more effectively, we need to examine our assumption, uh, assumptions rigorously and consider the data in ways that don't necessarily come naturally to us, um, which is very counterintuitive in some ways to at least uh, the culture I grew up in, American culture of, you know, trust yourself, you know, and trust what sort of your common sense in a sense. Um, not only is this practically hard as we're biased to trust ourselves, it might also be emotionally hard in that many of us construct our identities and sense of self-worth, security, etc., around self-trust, around trust in our own sort of common sense. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about how to manage, like if mm -hmm. somebody is training themselves to be more skeptical, more critical of their own uh, thinking, how to manage that transition yeah. emotionally and otherwise? I think that's a really interesting uh, question. And I think that the way, the way that I uh, view it is it's not don't trust yourself. It's don't trust yourself when you have no reason to do so, when you have no experience in something. So experts can trust all of their instincts and their common sense in their areas of expertise. And the problem comes when non-experts have a quote-unquote common sense opinion that really is just coming out of nowhere. And we do that all the time. There are areas where we're expert, um, but then we do the exact same thing in areas where we're not really expert. So if you think, for instance, I see this person and he's acting shifty to me, my common sense is he's doing something wrong, um, you shouldn't distrust that, that common sense because you're an expert in 
looking at people and in reading body language. You've done that your entire life. So something as simple as that, you actually are an expert and you should listen to yourself even if you're not really sure why you think something, you might be picking up on cues. The trick is ask yourself, why do I think this person is acting suspicious? Am I actually reading body language or am I using non-expertise? Am I putting someone else, am I putting someone else in this situation and this person just reminds me of someone I don't like, so now I think they're shifty. So you have to, it's not about not trusting yourself per se, it's about examining the reasons for your assumptions and always saying, okay, am I actually making this judgment based on some sort of expertise or am I like one of those people who makes a decision about whether or not I'm going to hire someone in the first 30 seconds of an interview just because I like them or didn't like them, um, in which case there's no expertise there. You, you don't know anything about the person. Um, so I think it depends on the judgment and it depends on what you're using to get there, if that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, I'll ask one more question and then we'll, and then we'll turn it over to Sid. Um, this is about uh, the value of creativity and imagination. How well do psychologists at this point understand creativity? I imagine it's not something, it's not a subject that gets you know, heavy research dollars thrown at it. Um, uh, have their insights yet yielded anything that you would think of as a sort of practical, useful approach to teaching or enhancing mm -hmm. people's creativity um, beyond letting your mind do its thing, you know, daydreaming, right. et cetera? Yeah, I think that we're starting to understand creativity, but it's a really, really hard thing to study because there are many different types of creativity. There are many manifestations of creativity. It's not like an overarching entity. You are or you are not creative. You can be creative in different ways, and there are different ways of, kind of having creative insights. Um, so psychologists are a little bit li uh, limited in that they have to study things in a laboratory, and so they have to have an artificial paradigm. And so they try to figure out, well, okay, how can I approximate creativity? Um, so that's why you get a lot of these studies that look at the eureka moment, the aha moment, where you are able to kind of put things together in a new way. That's one way that you can study creativity, but it's a ve and we're learning a lot about that. We're learning how people can become better at that, um, but once again, that's a very, very specific type of creative thinking, and being good at those kind of eureka problems are, is not the same thing as being more creative um, overall. What we do know, um, that's something that everyone can do, is that for whatever reason, um, being in nature helps people mm. become better at problem solving. So being surrounded by trees, by water, um, kind of those types of things, for whatever reason, make people better able to, um, to have um, insights and to think of imaginative solutions, so it's not just um, eureka moments, it's also, you know, you become better at brainstorming, the quality of your brainstorm ideas mm -hmm. becomes deeper. Um, and the more that we, actually the more we learn to pay attention, the more we focus on things, that's also the other kind of part of the puzzle. There is this, this focus part of creativity. People always say that it's um, taking the breaks, and those breaks are incredibly important. But you have to realize that for Holmes and for any other creative person, there's also a lot of hard work that comes before, and you can't distract yourself while you're doing that. So Holmes does have these bouts of intense thinking and concentration where he's really mulling over the problem before he takes his break. If he takes his break, he already has a lot of that worked through. And whenever you hear of you know, people like Poincaré or anyone else who's um, often used as an example of breakthrough creativity, I mean, they spent weeks, hours, you know, years sometimes mulling over problems, and so then the insight comes in a second, but there are different parts to that. So I think we can train our concentration, we can take more walks in natural habitats, and those are the things we definitely know can help. Um, it's a field that's, that's getting more and more attention. I think people would really love to know how to become more creative. And the good news is that you can, be, you can become more creative, and I think that everyone has a certain degree of creativity in them. It's not the type of thing 
you know, you, you can't say, oh, I'm not a creative person. I don't think not creative people exist. Great. Um, so listen up, all you people who, like me, uh, who think of yourselves as creative and live in big cities, time to get out. Uh, into the park. Um, and one of the most interesting points I think, you know, Maria, that you make in your book, um, Mastermind, and, and in the Big Think Mentor Workshop, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, um, is, is this fact that, or, or this is that Sherlock Holmes is a creative problem solver, that he does take information and recombine it in imaginative ways. You know, we tend to associate creativity falsely um, with the arts uh, only uh, often, mm -hmm. and 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 think of science and you know being a detective as somehow more kind of rational, linear, analytical, mm -hmm. not creative. And I think that's a really really important point that you make. Um, okay, so uh, uh, with that said, um, Sid, did you have any follow up questions you'd, you'd like to ask before we uh, before we wind this up? Uh, oh, I have a simple one, and maybe it just could be a good way to close. I'm kind of curious, uh, Maria, did you ever have, or what was, uh, an aha moment for you in reading any of the uh, home stories? Um, what was the aha moment for me? Or was there a particular aha moment for you reading any of the stories where you just, you know, where just kind of hit you, and you're like, oh, that makes perfect sense, in the well, way that he was approaching a problem? Well, I definitely had an aha moment um, when I realized that I wanted to write about Holmes, and I started rereading all the stories, and I was, it was more of a reading all of them in very close succession, very, very closely, you know, underlining, mm -hmm. highlighting, mm -hmm. writing notes in the margins, kind of doing this very close reading, um, and my aha moment was that Sherlock Holmes really is a different type of thinker from the thinker that I remembered from childhood and the mm -hmm. thinker that he's often portrayed as being because he's so imaginative and creative and warm and kind of not a cold machine at all. Mm -hmm. And it was very, to me, it was one of those, huh, why do people always think of him as this logical automaton, as, yep. as, as a computer, when he's anything but, when all of the things that make him Sherlock Holmes are things that a computer can't accomplish. Um, right. And that to me was... Or feel. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It, it, it was really eye-opening because even from my childhood from reading the stories, I didn't remember that. I, I instead had that kind of stereotype of he's this computer. Um, he's mm -hmm. just this perfectly logical person. He's anything but. It. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I, I, I want to... Um, thank everyone out there in the live audience for joining us today um, and Sid Burgess from our Big Think Mentor community and a special thanks to Maria Konnikova for, for being with us. Um, you've, you've been watching our Big Think Mentor Hangout with Maria Konnikova, author of Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. Um, visit youtube.com slash user slash big think mentor to take Maria's workshop on thinking skills from the master detective and learn life skills for personal and professional growth. I'm Jason Gotts, an editor with Big Think, and thanks everyone for, for joining us today, Sid and Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.